Good evening, everyone. My name is Emily and I am with the Miami University Alumni Association. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm I apologize for the delay. We were had a little technical difficulties um, that we were working through. And I'm also sorry for my dog behind me now. Um, thank you so much for joining us for our virtual wine tasting with Jack Keegan. Jack is an instructor emeritus who taught the ever popular viticulture and enology class at Miami for 25 years and is still teaching today. Um, Jack's wine class is always full. His chapter wine tastings are always well attended and tonight is no exception as we have Miami alumni and friends across the country joining us. Um, the Miami University is Alumni Association is excited for the opportunity to, opportunity to bring Jack to you as we celebrate the holiday season. Um, there is an ask a question button located at the bottom of the screen. I'll be monitoring these questions throughout, so please feel free to ask any questions you may have, and I will relay them to Jack throughout the tasting. With all of that being said, go ahead and take it away, Jack. Thanks, Emily. I always like being upstaged by a dog. <laughs> Yes, yes. So welcome, everyone. It is uh, wonderful to see you during the holiday season. I realize this is actually our third holiday program. I was thinking about that and just the various ways we did it. In fact, it was last year was on December 16th also, as you will see. So welcome. Um, as you know, this is how we always start. Here is the list of wines that you see there, the Villa Sande Prosecco, uh, the Canard Duchesne Brut Champagne, the 20 Silverado Sauvignon Blanc, the, the 18 Davis Bynum Russian River Pinot Noir, the 19, Be the 19 Ben Marco Uco Malbec, excuse me, from Argentina, uh, and the 19, my favorite neighbor, Harvey and Harriet Red Blend from Paso Robles. So we will talk about those. And so, of course, the first thing we always do is, of course, open up some wine. You're going to have to listen to me without having something to drink. There you go. So, of course, this is the wine we're using, the Villa Sande Prosecco. And as usual, I will tell you that luckily it has a tab. It's always a problem with being left-handed because the tabs go backwards. You know, they really do it mostly for right-handed people. And so I just have to make sure that I take it off properly. Um, as many of you know, I only I never take the capsule off. As I told you many times before, John Dome, who taught the wine course before me, always said the bottle looks naked when you take off the whole capsule. So I never do. Um, and then, of course, I hold with my non-dominant hand because I'm left-handed. On my right thumb is on the top. You pull down the tab, turn it six times. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, of course, it's completely open. Uh, and then I usually leave that on. And then what I do is hold the cork and turn the bottle. And in fact, it's already beginning to come up. And then you have it completely under control. If you go to YouTube someplace, you will see, in fact, uh, Goran Djokovic uh, actually uh, hitting himself in the head with a flying cork. You don't want to do that. Trust me. There. Not bad at all. So that's how they open it. Ooh, nice aroma. I'm hoping you're seeing the same thing. Another thing that I like to do, uh, especially today, because it is the holidays and it's a question of remembering friends. And in fact, a former student who's a good friend gave me this wine glass. And so that's why I decided I would use it tonight. I don't think he's on, but that's okay. As I think I've told you before, uh, this wine is... Um, um, flutes are in fact widely used. It has fairly big bubbles, as you can see. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit more about how the wine is made, but look how beautiful it is in there. Now, you see now that people who are sort of in the know um, say that it's best if you have good wine to, in fact, put it into a white wine glass. Uh, but I really like the flutes. I love watching the bubbles go up. You can certainly catch the aroma. And while this is a perfectly good wine, it is not an aged champagne. And so it would be something that I would use uh, in this manner. See all the wonderful bubbles that are there. So let's smell this wine. Mm, you know, so nice. Yes, go ahead. I have a couple of people here, so I'm, I'm sharing. So I don't have to drink all six bottles tonight. Uh, and so I am sharing. And so you see this just wonderful thing. And of course, you smell it. Wonderful, fresh aroma, fruit, maybe little pears. Uh, just a slight hint of um, uh, really nice. Um, uh, I sort of get a little citrus in it. Really pleasant, just nice fruits there. And of course, if you taste this wine,
Mm. Mm. It has a decent amount of sugar to it, but it has a good acid. has a little bit of that chalky finish, nice minerally finish there. Really pleasant. In fact, actually very, very pleasant. And it's the type of wine, you know, of course, you paid this, you know, that isn't so expensive that you wouldn't mind, you know, attaching. In fact, by the way, I think especially for the holidays, a wonderful aperitif is maybe a teaspoon of Chambord or a teaspoon of um, creme de cassis. Or what I really like, too, is uh, Saint-Germain, which is the elderflower liqueur. A little bit of that in this, too, just brings out that aromas and flavors. Makes a wonderful aperitif and looks and very, very, you know, sort of sophisticated. So it makes it sort of fun with this, but boy, just a really, really nice little wine. Let me tell you a little about this wine. Uh, as you can see, it is in fact from Italy up there in the north. Uh, and so that in fact is, is where it is from. You get a little closer. In fact, I've told you this before, especially with the Prosecco. Um, Prosecco is now considered a region, but it used to be considered the grape. And the problem ends up being is with the grape, that means that you could make it anywhere. And all of a sudden, they were finding that they were getting Proseccos out of Brazil, of all places. And so they changed it and went back to the old name for the grape, which is Gleada. Uh, as you can see, Prosecco can come from a, lot, a very large area uh, over in Friuli, uh, but also most of it ends up being in the Veneto, as you can see. The two best towns are the two towns you see there, Valdoviadene and Conigliano. Uh, and the best of the best is in a very small vintage or a very small area called the Cartesi, uh, which is just wonderful. But you can see it's north of Treviso, beautiful countryside, uh, always to see. Uh, this is, in fact, is the Palladian Villa uh, that Villa Sandi, in fact, does own. Uh, so it's a wonderful place, in fact, to go and uh, to see and visit uh, there. This, of course, shows you what the beautiful, beautiful countryside that's like. And so just wonderful, wonderful area to visit and to see uh, in there. Look at that. Just uh, so beautiful. So it really ends up being wonderful uh, wines and, and very nice. The thing is, this Prosecco, of course, is overtaken. Champagne is the, probably the most widely grown or made sparkling wine in the world. Um, they've been worried about overproduction, a number of things like that. But so far, things have been going okay. Um, this wine is 85% Glera. That's the grape that used to be called Prosecco. 15% uh, Chardonnay. Though, and I'll be honest, you know, you look at the websites of the various places. This was from their website. Other places says it's 100% Glera. Um, alcohol, of course, quite light, as most sparkling wines are, 11%. Residual sugar, 14 grams per liter. So it's up there. It's in the, it's in the extra dry rather than the brute range. Uh, they are actually very much the top of the brute range because you can go to 1.5. Um, they're softly pressed, as you can see, must have stored in controlled temperature tanks. Uh, and then, of course, it spends two months in that. Uh, and, you know, and then after that period, it comes out under pressure and is basically sterile filtered and bottled. Uh, it was given 89 from Wines and Spirits. Uh, it says lively, zippy, sweetness, bringing out lemon, lime, and green apple flavors. I get more pear. Clean, pleasantly sweet sparkler for grilled prawns with fruit salsa. Sounds good to me. And really, I don't mind the sweetness. I don't really get, I mean, see there's a little bit of sweetness there, but it's really beautifully balanced with the acid. So very, very nice. As I mentioned, by the way, uh, this is always interesting. It's an interesting thing in the wine industry. Who did it first? In other words, sparkling wine, champagne has been around for a long time. In fact, as we'll see in a moment, even longer uh, with some of these wines. And so, but here, when Pasteur, actually proved that it was yeast that was causing fermentation, then people tried to figure out, well, how can we make this faster and easier? Because champagne, by law, it's 15 months, and in many cases, maybe three or four years on the lees. So can we make a sparkling wine easier? And so they did, in fact, begin um, experimenting. And in Italy, uh, a man named Martinotti, and that's the name you will see in Italy, began, in fact, making wine in these stainless steel tanks. Uh, and then, of course, another gentleman in France, uh, Mr. Charmeau, uh, he also, Charmotte, excuse me, he was the one who did it there and, in fact, patented it. So typically, if you talk to an Italian, he will they will tell you it's the Martinotti method. And, of course, you talk to a Frenchman and most of the rest of the world, they use the word Charmotte bulk process. And so that's how, in fact, this wine has been made, which is why it can be relatively inexpensive. I had to laugh, though, when I was looking this up to to check or to see i put in of course prosecco tanks because that's what i consider that is but of course what were the pictures i got 
Prosecco tanks. In other words, this this tank top that says, I'll be there in a Prosecco. Uh, and so there were a lot of different tank tops that had Prosecco on them. Who knew? Uh, so I thought it was pretty funny, in fact, to see. So that's, in fact, a little bit about the introduction to that wine. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, this is also, of course, December 16th. This is Beethoven's birthday. Uh, and I've been talked a lot about Beethoven, but cannot get past the day without at least uh, mentioning, in fact, his uh, his birthday this today in there. Uh, some other things happening in the world of wine. Um, and in fact, it's been interesting. I've probably seen four or five articles about this. They really feel this is, in fact, a tractor that has uh, you know, no driver. In other words, it will be completely done by computer and by uh, uh, satellite. Uh, and so this is happening more and more. In fact, many people, in fact, use satellites and use GPS to guide their tractors. And so they're basically there just to make sure nothing goes wrong. And so this is happening more and more. And this is what we're going to see. We are going to see self-propelled tractors. And in fact, many of these, in fact, using just electric. In fact, electric also, 100% uh, in many of these. And it's sort of amazing to see how some of that has changed in the world of wine. And so we're seeing that in more than wine, but certainly in wine also. Um, the interesting article, too, about we're seeing Swiss wines. You don't see a lot of Swiss wines in the market. Why? Because the Swiss drink it. That's why. And so, in fact, it was interesting to see that, in fact, some of the good wines from Switzerland are coming in on the market. So that was sort of interesting to see also this week in the world of wine. Uh, this also, you see this beautiful painting? This is actually the painting that's going to be on the latest bottle of Mouton Rothschild or Rothschild. Um, every year they have, in fact, a very famous artist. Many of them, in fact, very, very famous who sold paintings for millions of dollars. And I apologize, I didn't check the, the gentleman's name for this, but this, in fact, will be on the label for the latest vintage, which I think is 2020, uh, for Mouton Rothschild or Rothschild, very expensive wine uh, there. In fact, speaking of expensive wines, you know, if you're still looking for a Christmas present for me, here, in fact, are the most expensive or the best Sauvignon Blancs, or excuse me, Cabernet Sauvignon Blancs uh, on Wine Searcher. As you can see, the 100 acres is only $710 a bottle, but that's nothing, of course, compared to this Screaming Eagle, which is at, what, $4,694. So pretty amazing uh, to see some of the things that are going on. Of course, you can see the prices on all of those uh, and their scores. So Cabernet, of course, is um, very nice. Um, I looked at the Pinot Noirs, too. They were not quite as expensive. And interestingly, a couple of them, in fact, were from Australia. So our next wine. Before I get any further, Emily, do you have any questions? Yeah, we do have one that came in. Sure. Um, someone said, when pouring sparkling for a group, do you pour a small amount in each glass and then even the pour, or do you try to create a full pour glass by glass? Good question. Um, I typically will pour a little bit because you will get such a, a you know froth of bubbles right in the beginning and then come back. And I will tell you, in fact, um, uh, Mary Horn, who uh, works down in Cincinnati, she's very, very much a champagne aficionado. And she always tells me too, especially the important thing is, unlike very often with beer where you slide down the side of the glass, you want to pour the sparkling wine into the middle of the glass. Uh, and so that is, in fact, how you would do that. But yes, typically I will pour some simply because it froths up so much. And then I will come back, you know, probably maybe six. Well, usually you can get six to eight pours, uh, depending on the size of the glass from a bottle. So I will pour, maybe pour the first ones and then go and top them up afterwards. The nice thing about the sparkling wine is two things. A, they don't hold much. B, you don't have um, uh, it. You can you sort of get five or six glasses out of it. And so then it's fine right afterwards. And you can top it up pretty well with that. Okay. So why number two? This is, in fact, uh, the Canard du Chien. Uh, and we will start with this first. Pour this out. In there. Of course, you know, when you do things like with wine, I get things like this too. Uh, this is, this is the Wine Lover's Christmas. And so, of course, it's like the 12 Days of Christmas, but it's all about wine and various things. Instead of Lords of Leaping, uh, you have things like 10 Crushers Crushing, etc. on on it. So it's good for Christmas. So this is Canard Duchenne, a, a, a very well-known house uh, there. It also has a tab uh, going in. It's always the most difficult thing. In fact, when I was teaching, in fact, 
this this time I always had the students because many people have never opened a bottle of sparkling wine. So I had the students come down and open wine. And as I'm having the problem right now, the biggest problem is sometimes just getting the stupid capsule off of it. You know, it's like I will either take a knife or I will have to use my, you know, a fingernail or something like that to finally get it to open up. So don't feel badly. I have this problem all the time if you have this problem too. There, I finally got it off. There, again, same way, always. You know, it sort of becomes, it's, it's the drill. Six times. And I try to loosen up a little bit so it doesn't still stick. Make the turn. I've done this a lot, as you can probably tell. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. This is a glass also given to me by a good friend. Beautiful sort of uh, uh, thistle sort of shape there. As you can see, you get all that froth. And so, you know, just to continue on, they're very often, sometimes I'm pretty lucky, I can get it to the top um, and it will just, the bubbles will get to the top and then it will just die back down. But it's, uh, I'd rather not waste champagne. That's why I always tell my students too, I never, I never watch Formula One uh, because to watch them throw champagne around instead of drinking it, I think that's just sinful. Uh, look at the bubbles on that. Wow, isn't that just gorgeous? I say it every time. It reminds me of an upside down blizzard. By the way, in case you haven't noticed, uh, if you haven't looked at the weather forecast, uh, don't. Just wait a couple of days. Uh, we're supposed to get here in Oxford a few inches of snow on Thursday, and then it's supposed to get good and cold uh, for the rest of the week. Uh, there. there was something. Oh, hand me that the silver thing there, please. Thank you, sir. One of the things that we show you too, and I really do like it. In fact, I was just looking, there was a gift thing about this. And this is a great way to store sparkling wine after you've opened it. Because for one thing, you have nothing but carbon dioxide in here. So if you put that on and then close it up, then all the bubbles are there. This wine will be perfectly drinkable tomorrow. It'll be fine if you need to wait till Sunday or Monday, you can. Uh, it really is amazing how well the wines will keep. And so I really do like these uh, as them. And you could get them, you know, wine shops, obviously Amazon, anywhere like that. So it's really sort of pretty neat with that. Okay. So, and this is the difference. You see the bubbles are smaller than you saw in the Prosecco. Not surprising. By the way, you may notice that the bubbles seem to come from, always come from the same spot because it, it has to have imperfections in the glasses where the bubbles will then begin to rise from. And so that's what happens. And this, if I left it, I'm not going to. If I left it for like a half hour, 45 minutes, it would probably still be bubbling because mostly this wine has probably spent three years in the bottle with the bubbles. And so the bubbles get very, very well integrated into the wine. And so because of that, they come out very slowly for a long period of time. And so that's what you're seeing in there. Just absolutely gorgeous, especially in a beautiful glass like this one. So let's smell this. Different darker. I always think more uh, bready brioche, sort of that bread um, crust. Uh, you're also getting, I think, sort of almonds, hazelnuts. You really are much more in those nutty uh, amounts. This is because these wines typically have reserve wines in them, meaning that the wines are older in these, you know, that have been added to this. This is why this wine is non-vintage NV. It does not come from a certain year, even though most of the wine may have come from, say, 2016, they added reserve wines to this. And so this is what goes on uh, in this wine. Beautiful nose. And of course, you taste this wine. Mm -mm -mm. Mm. Just lovely. Great acidity. Uh, that wonderful, you know, again, another chalky texture, nice grip to it, uh, very much almond hazelnuts. I mean, really is much more into the nuttiness than not as much fruit. A little bit of citrus, a little bit of, you know, maybe apple, definitely apple in there. Uh, but it's it has that sort of smokiness, that breadiness to it, too, that really makes it nice and round and just just delicious. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Mm. So, some about this wine. Uh, let's see here. Canard Duchenne, as you can see. Um, this is, of course, is what we're talking about. This, of course, is the Champagne region up there in the northeast corner 
of France, um, really not that far from Paris. In fact, a lot of people now with the TGV will go to Champagne for lunch. Uh, this is Champagne region itself. Uh, it has a number of different regions. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the wines I'm seeing now are coming from the south, from the Côte de Bar uh, and the Aube down there in the south. But you can see, of course, the Montagne de Reims, uh, where most of this, in fact, this wine, this is where Canard du Chêne is, in the, again, the mountains around Reims, the Montagne de Reims, uh, the Valley of the Marne are the three in the Côte de Blanc, uh, are the three major areas that you see in there uh, that make up the wines. Uh, this is, in fact, is the putting together of two houses, and not really even champagne houses. He was a barrel maker. And her family made wine, and they were married in 1868, and so started this company, which still is in existence till today. Uh, here is the winery. A uh, beautiful picture of the vineyards uh, there behind the uh, by, behind the winery in their offices, uh, and so really very lovely. Uh, beautiful picture, of course, all of the bottles in down in the cellar, and they have these chalk caves which stay 55, 58. By law, they must spend 15 months with the yeast in the bottle before they will come out. And in many cases, like this one, probably may spend two or three years in the bottle. That, of course, is what gives it that bready toastiness uh, that is so uh, so prized in champagne. And so that's what's going on with this wine. Uh, as you can see, non-vintage, it is a blend of 60 different areas and there are 60 different vineyards because they get it and then they do the blending of the cuvee. And that's 40% Pinot Noir. 40% uh, Pinot Meunier, or sometimes you'll just see the word Meunier now, and 20% Chardonnay. Uh, reserved for several years, make up at least 20% of the blend, order for its consistent, three years in the lease. And this is very dry. In fact, this has half the sugar in it that the first wine did, seven grams per liter. And so and that's that's a relatively dry champagne. You can get some that have no dosage. That's what it's called, the sugar that's added. Uh, but um, seven grams is fairly low. I would say that's you know, uh, fairly low. Very often they end up like nine or ten. Uh, not a big difference uh, in there. Decanter gave this 91. Smoldering, smokiness, and reduction totally covers the nose. There's a yeast, cardamom, honey, and fine sourdough on the creamy palate with refined riches and steely grip. It's a really a very, uh, a lovely champagne. And as you probably saw, not that expensive because champagne, of course, can get very, very expensive. And you'll be very lucky if you can find any for less than about $35 to $40 today. Uh, in there. So Canard du Chêne is a, uh, a, a pretty much a good value, I think, uh, in there. Okay. So as many of you know, my other hat was, in fact, writing the greenhouses. And in fact, I just recently uh, gave a talk to our local garden club on holiday plants. And so I thought, in fact, I would like sort of, sort of, you know, separate the various wines a little bit, give you a moment to taste these wines and enjoy them, and talk a little bit about some of the holiday plants, how you take care of them, and in fact, what they're around. So I thought we'd, I would start with paper whites. Um, in fact, well, some of my family will know now. In fact, I bought paper whites for all of them for Christmas because they just really are so lovely and smell so wonderful. Uh, they are, in fact, as you can see, a daffodil. Narcissus is the, is the Latin name for daffodils. And so it's in the daffodil family, has thousands of different kinds of daffodils in there. They're super easy to grow. You can just put them, in fact, in um, in stones or, or barely covered, as you can see here, because they really are something not for keeping a long time. They really are something to be enjoyed uh, and then basically, you know, composted uh, because, in fact, they're not easy to um, uh, to regrow. Uh, they are native, uh, in fact, of a number of places in um uh, over in Europe, around the Mediterranean, uh, and in fact now have become naturalized in several of our southern states uh, there. But you can see this is how they grow and how they look when they're in full bloom uh, there. It was interesting, too. It's always wonderful when I do these talks because I always learn so much. And one of them is, in fact, that the problem with paper whites in many cases is that they get too tall. And what perfect place to talk about this, because what studies have shown is if you add alcohol to your water, you can keep your, your paper whites shorter. And so what you're seeing there is a, the paper whites on the one side have had no alcohol. And by the way, you can use, in fact, they said vodka or gin. Uh, and so it's it's really actually ethanol. Uh, and there's 2%, 4%, 6%, 8%, and, or, or, or I should say, yeah, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10% alcohol added to the water, and it keeps them shorter. So I may try that myself when I grow my paper whites. So that was interesting to see. So 
you know, it's just it's just not for drinking. You could actually use it to keep your paper white shorter. So that was interesting. Uh, Ziva, look how beautiful they are. It's a nice cultivar of them. So it really is sort of a fun uh, a fun plant to have. Uh, the problem is, as I will tell you, and so it's always important too, they are toxic to cats, dogs, and horses. So if you do have them, keep them up someplace or where your animals can't get them. Uh, so it sort of makes a difference with that. Okay. Any questions, Emily? Um. Yeah, we've had a few come in. So let me find the one. Oh, how long do unopened bottles of sparkling wine last? We have a couple bottles of 20-year-old Dom at home. Are they still drinkable? If it's 20-year-old Dom, I'd be happy to try them out with them. Uh, yes, probably. If it is... It's sort of like any wine, and and it's interesting. The English like to drink older champagnes, and if it is a good, um, what we call prestige wine, uh, like Dom Perignon or Cristal or Tete du Cuvée or any number of those kinds of wines, um, very often they, many people say they taste better after five or six years in the bottle, uh, and in fact should last a very, very long time. Uh, 20-year-old Dom Perignon, should still be drinking. The nice thing is because it is so widely available, you can look online and find uh, out uh, that people in fact have tried it and in fact see what's going on. I really, I truly doubt that if it's 20 years old that it's over the hill. Uh, it still in fact is probably drinking very, very well. Um, there'll be less bubbles. It will be more golden. Uh, it will probably have more pronounced uh, sort of uh, that, that brioche or like creme brulee, they tend to get a little sort of darker that way as they age, uh, but still should be wonderful. I, I would be surprised if not. The other thing, of course, I hasten to add is as long as they were stored okay. In other words, where there's not a lot of vibration, where there's not sunlight, where the temperatures fluctu doesn't fluctuate really crazily, then typically it's probably fine. That would be my... Guess, I guess I should say. Okay? Yep, that's good for right now. Okay. Our next wine, in fact, as you saw in the thing, is the Silverado. It is a screw cap. I don't have any problem with screw caps, especially with things like Sauvignon Blancs and wines that are not for, in fact, long aging. So it sort of works one way or the other, uh, certainly with that. Um, here, of course, I have a white wine glass, in fact, for this. Really, really light in color. This is the mirror from the Miller Ranch. There. And again, really, really pale in color, which is perfectly fine. This is a 2020. And if you swirl, here, of course, with sparkling, we need to worry about swirling so much. The bubbles bring the aromas up to your nose. Here, swirling probably helps a bit. And luckily, in fact, I've actually I had it in the refrigerator, but it's been out for a while. And that's good, too. Uh, so many places, you know, they keep their wines too cold. And we say the wine's done. You know, you can't really get the aromas until. And when I'm talking about temperature, mm, 55 to 60 is probably fine. Um, and maybe in the, in the wintertime, maybe a little, you know, a little on the warmer side uh, because it's not going to. But uh, again, if you swirl and smell this wine, mm, Sauvignon Blanc, uh, a little uh, grapefruit, um, a little gooseberry, also a little bit of herbal, almost a little chamomile there. Nice, in fact, oh, just all kinds of nice aromas. A little ginger. Yeah, a little grassiness. Just, it really just has a whole bunch of nice uh, aromas coming out. Very savory. Mm. And of course, if you taste this wine. Mm. Mm. Nice acidity, really clean, really crisp. Has that almost a little jalapeno in there too. Obviously not the heat, but the flavor of a little pepperiness uh, is certainly there with the grapefruit and all the other fruit that are there. Really very nice, beautiful, beautiful Sauvignon Blanc. And surprisingly in some ways lean for... California. Typically, Sauvignon Blancs from California are a little more fruity, a little bit more, oh, maybe honeydew melon, a little rounder, you know, a little bit more fruit, where this one has a nice leanness to it. 
uh, really harkens back a little bit to the Loire, uh, not quite New Zealand, but a lot closer to that than the other ones. Part of it, a little cooler climate with Silverado. Nice wine. Some things about this wine. Uh, thank you. Um, as you see, Silverado 2020, this is from the Miller Ranch. Uh, so, in fact, a specific ranch there in Yachtville. Um, so, to tell you exactly where you are, of course, there you are in Napa Valley, just north of, of, of um, uh, San Francisco. Uh, in fact, gee, not even an hour, depending on the traffic, of course, uh, there. Here, of course, is the area itself. And you can see here carefully, uh, there to the south is Yachtville. And remember, the further south you go in Napa Valley, the cooler it is because you're closer to the water and to the marine influence coming up the va up the valley, uh, you know, up the San Pablo Bay. And so the further south you go, the cooler it is, and Yonville's fairly there to the south. And so this is a very sort of coolish climate, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, and they should be grown relatively cool anyway. But this, in fact, shows that characteristic very, very nicely. Uh, in there. Uh, this, in fact, is the Silverado uh, Vineyard uh, Winery. Here's another picture, in fact, from the air. So you get an idea of what it looks like there. In fact, on that hit hill uh, there in Yonville, it's probably Highway 29 right below it uh, there. Actually, surprisingly, I've never visited there. Um, I will say it's interesting. It was, in fact, recently purchased by Bill Foley. Uh, Bill Foley's a billionaire who owns Oh, I think he owns the Las Vegas hockey team also, and a whole bunch of other things. But I will say he's he seems to be an excellent steward of his wine properties. Uh, he recently bought Chateau Saint-Jean, and Saint-Jean was, was always one of my favorite wineries, and they sort of fell on hard time. They were not well taken care of. He bought it a year or so ago, so I have real... I have real promise that St. Jean, in fact, will come back to the quality that it used to have. Uh, and I think the same thing, in fact, Silverado, in fact, um, sort of disappeared for a while. And I think we'll come back under his under his leadership in all of this. This is the Miller Ranch. This is, in fact, the, the vineyard where the wines come from. So it's sort of in, really neat to see the, the specific spot there, uh, obviously, probably along the uh, Napa River. Um, this is 93% Sauvignon Blanc, so there's 7% Semillon. Semillon gets a little bit of softness, a little bit more of that waxiness to it that's in there. But it's 100% from Miller Ranch, and it's uh, tank fermented, and they don't do any malolactic fermentation. So they keep all the acid in there, and it's obvious that they have kept the acid in that wine. So really sort of nice from that standpoint. Uh, and so very, very good uh, in there. In fact, speaking of very good, let me make sure this is off. There. Um, it got, in fact, uh, 93 from the tasting panel. Uh, it says aromatics are breathtaking, seeing which if they say lime, eh, maybe. Uh, juicy pineapple, honeydew melon, key lime, grapefruit converts the palate. Uh, tangerine spark of sensational with white flower petals. Uh, they get a lot out of this wine, let me tell you. Honey, honey uh, pears uh, for this lean body certainly is uh, athletic wine. Didn't realize it. Drop and give me 20, I guess, for that. Uh, 90 from the wine enthusiast. Again, with grapefruit, as it says, rich accord pear and vanilla candy. And 90 from Jim Suckling. He says peach, green apple, passion fruit. Passion fruit, I can see. And lime on the nose. See the differences? That's one thing I always like showing, too. There are three well-respected wine tasters, and their ideas are different. Their notes are different. Uh, and so I think that's also important to remember. We don't get too caught up into what how it works and what we think. Uh, with all of that. Okay. Any questions, Emily? Or should I just savor this wine for a moment? Yeah, you can. Um, we don't have anything super specific to, we have questions, but not, actually, here's one that just came in. That's okay. more specific. Okay. Sorry, I'm looking at my other screen to read not it. Um, what's the biggest difference between um, California Sauvignon Blanc and Australian New Zealand? Yeah. It would be, well, it's really the acid. New Zealand, in fact, they really have gone for, I mean, New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs are basically almost like sort of punch you in the face Sauvignon Blancs, uh, if they are. And though that has also changed and softened over time. But because it's a core climate, fairly windy, they get, in fact, a lot more of that jalapeno. And they're a lot leaner and, and a lot sort of... Uh, I don't, I wouldn't say bigger, but they're just much more direct. I think it's because of the acidity where they really hit you um, much more on the palate than these do. These are, these wines, of course, this wine has a fair amount of acidity to it, but it's a, it's a little gentler. 
where uh, and by the and I love Sauvignon Blancs from New Zealand. Don't get me wrong, but the the style is very different, and it really ends up being much more sort of in your face, a lot more acidic, uh, etc. And then the Loire is sort of in between. And again, I really like a good Puy Fumé or a Sancerre uh, can be also very very nice and and very appropriate for the place that they are from. So very nice wines, three different styles. Then of course. I always take great comfort. There's a was a famous wine uh, writer, uh, and someone asked him if he ever confused uh, a Bordeaux with a Burgundy, and he looked at the person and said, "Not since lunch." So if he can do it, you know, with that, I think you know I could easily be fooled by where the wine came from. Uh, but they they do seem to have three different styles, but it is easy to also get confused. Good. Mm -mm -mm. Let's see what we have here. Oh, that's right. Um, the next plant I thought I would highlight a bit is amaryllis. Um, it's really interesting. Of course, this is it. You probably all know, in fact, what amaryllis are. But in fact, the amaryllis that we talk about aren't. This is, in fact, the true amaryllis. And in fact, it's actually from Africa. What you are, in fact, or what we're growing is this hip, uh, hippiastrum. Uh, this is, in fact, one of the species of it. In fact, grab me that there. I'll show it later too on there. Um, but uh, it actually is from South America, and they have been in fact bred for a very, very long time. Uh, some things about it, because this is of course the time of year that people are buying them. In fact, I have two pots of ones I just planted like four or five days ago. Um, the larger the bulb, the more flowers you'll get, and there's no question. In fact, and I have seen mammoth bulbs certainly in the greenhouse, and they will last forever. I mean. I had bulbs in the greenhouse and I worked there for 42 years and there were bulbs that were there when I got there that were still alive and the whole pot was nothing but bulbs. Just absolutely amazing. They're really best in narrow uh, containers. I'll show you this when we get to the end. Uh, only a little bigger than the, the bulb itself. Uh, and you really want the bulb to be exposed. As you can see, you fill half of the soil, add the bulb, then let it sit above the container and then add the rest of the soil, firm it in. And then I water very lightly if the if I'm not seeing the flower buds, once the flower buds come, you can increase your water, but you don't want to soak it too much until they in fact come up. As I see, dry side and still I see growth, uh, low ferment fertilization. Uh, see how much sun you can give it uh, uh, until it flowers. And then when the flap the flower is done, you'll cut off the the flower head. You can let the the uh, stem die. And then if you want to rebloom it, many people just simply dispose of them. But if you want to rebloom it, and I have successfully many years, give it as much sun as you can. Plant it out in the garden. Sometimes even leave it in the pot and plant it in the garden. But very often I'll just leave it in the pots, grow it up up on the deck, and then when they die back in the winter, maybe with a little bit of frost, then I'll keep them. And then when they start growing again, they start growing again. So that's in fact how you do them. In fact. Very often I have them, in fact, downstairs. It's sort of dark, and they'll, I'll bring them up when they start to grow. And typically you don't have to repot very often. In fact, three or four years is easy for it. And so that's, in fact, how you grow amaryllis. I thought I would show you some beautiful ones here. This is Elvas, actually. In fact, bought three of those uh, that will be blooming a bit later. They haven't started to grow yet. Um, Estrella, look at his beautiful pinks. Oh, there's so many different kinds. Uh, this is Bogota. This is another one, in fact, that I purchased. Uh, just wonderful colors and, you know, with it, very sort of tropical looking. Uh, this double dream. So there's so many different kinds of emeralds. And they really are wonderful Christmas flowers uh, to have. So I thought I would share a little bit about them uh, with you today. And there, of course, is Queen of the Night. Beautiful dark colors. Emeralds are just great flowers and fun to have and not too difficult to grow. Some things are just too much, but I think emeralds are something that can be great fun. Uh, to have. Okay. Your next wine is Davis Bynum. Again, I I really still feel that your double hinge corkscrew, the waiter's corkscrew, is truly the best. Um, Teflon worm, as we've talked about before, double hinged, I think is really nice. And when I do this, of course, I always cut off the top of the foil. And I find the easiest place to do it is right here at this lip. And so I'll cut it off right there. And typically, you don't have to give a whole lot of strength to it. But if you get and you have a good sharp knife, by the way, you can't take these still onto airplanes because, you know, I could just I could just kill you with this, you know. Uh, and so consequently, you still can't. So don't take your corkscrew in your carry on. 
uh, otherwise it will be confiscated. Um, and of course, what I do is I always like to take the tip and put it right in the middle of the cork and sort of shove it in there a little bit. And then of course, turn it and bring it up and turn the bottle at the same time. Now the worm is right in the middle of the cork. And so I just have to very easily bring it in until it's almost all the way in. And sometimes with a long cork, it's important to get it there. And then of course you use the first hinge and you push it in so it's on the glass. And then of course you lift it up very easily. And then you take the second hinge, lift it again, and you've got the cork out. Very, very nice, no cork in the bottle. And so it's really nice. Very often too, you see people of course do this at your, at your table. And that's because as you can see, the name of that is right on the, on the label in this. I decided to grab me that please. Sorry, I put that too far away. I got out one of my different uh, burgundy balloons for this because Pinot Noir is very nice. I am not, you know, it, it, to me, a decent glass is a decent glass, so it's no big deal. Uh, but in fact, it is nice to have them. And if you have them, use them. Look at the color. The nice thing about this is, and this is what Pinot Noir should look like, in my opinion. It should be not very dark. You really should have this wonderful, you should be able to look through it, should be this really great cherry color. Uh, and so very nice that way uh, in there. So again, the nice thing about having a balloon is you do have, you can swirl it so nicely. And so it just looks so beautiful as it swirls around your glass. So, and you know, there's, there's more to wine than just drinking it. I know that's shocking, but uh, you know, it really is. Look at that. Just absolutely beautiful. And of course, what you're doing is releasing all those aromas. So when you put it to your nose, oh. <laughs> I'll be honest, I really like Pinot Noirs and this is just lovely. Oh, it's just, oh gee, it's that, you know, sour cherry, uh, a little bit of that earthiness. Mm, beautiful, a little bit of apple. Just so beautiful, just glorious. And of course you taste this wine. Mm. Classic, classic Pinot Noir. I mean, really just, it is just, it's an absolute pleasure to drink. There's no question about it. You know, that is just beautiful. Just a beautiful wine. And yes, and I've had lots of Pinot Noirs. It has a, there's a sweetness there. But of course, there's no sugar. It's all the fruit. There's that wonderful, you know, again, and and not even so much sour cherry, but almost a, almost a, not quite maraschino, but a, a black cherry that's there that's so nice. And then there's that, that underlying, you know, almost leathery tobacco-iness that's also there in the background. That just makes it not only beautiful to drink, but it makes it a wonderful food wine. Pinot Noir makes such wonderful food wines. And of course, I've said it every time, a natural with Pinot Noir or Pinot Noir, Jay Jack, salmon. Uh, and of course, but you could do that. You could do that with a filet that was not very dark because again, the butteriness of the filet would go very nicely. This could just go with so many different things. I think charcuterie, uh, would be really nice. There's just really so many things that go so well with this wine. Dang, that's nice. Gee. Much better than, I, I'll be honest, much better than I even remember. And I've, I've used Davis Bynum wines a number of times uh, for a number of reasons. A, because it's one of the oldest wineries. Now, of course, owned by Rodney Strong Group. Uh, Rodney Strong himself, of course, it's just also now just the name of the person. Uh, and but uh, and, but just beautiful wine. Sorry to just go on and on, but it's too nice not to uh, enjoy. So some things about this wine and this winery. Um, Davis Bynum, if you can see Pinot Noir, Sonoma County, actually Russian River Valley. And I really do like Russian River Pinot Noirs. It is in Sonoma. There, of course, you see Sonoma County right there along the Pacific. In fact, the Russian River flows into the Pacific right there uh, also. Uh, this shows you all the different parts of it. 
Russian River, of course, is that sort of bluish green in the middle, Green Valley, it surrounds Green Valley. And of course, then also the other place that ends up being important, especially for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, is the Sonoma Coast. Uh, and there have been some new areas, Petaluma Gap, and uh, down in there too, uh, that are also very good because it gets, it has access to the marine layer, which means it has the cool temperatures that can successfully then grow Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. And so this is why these areas have become so important and make such really wonderful wines uh, that are there. Is there pictures, in fact, from uh, from their vineyards there? Uh, in there. This, of course, is, uh, I meant to check. I don't think Davis Bynum, Davis Bynum is the older gentleman who is there. Uh, he, of course, had this, of course, sold it to the Rodney Strong group. Uh, he's now talking to Greg Mortal. I think I got a picture of him also uh, there. He's the winemaker. Um, I took a bunch of alums out in 2011, and it was during harvest, and he could not have been more gentleman-like and spent plenty of time with us. And it was really, really great. Uh, and so, and this is, uh, you know, you get those kinds of connections. And of course, he makes such gorgeous wines that, of course, I would drink Davis Bynum. So really just beautiful there. Um, cellar fermentation, 13 months in French and Hungarian oak barrels, 22% uh, new. So there's some new oak flavoring there. Of course, the other thing there, it's also what gives it some of that, the darkness, the earthiness, in fact, you see in that wine uh, there. Uh, and as you can see, uh, and I think 91 is low for this wine. Uh, 91 for the Susie, rich, rounded, which it certainly is. Uh, several vineyards, including the estate's Jane's Vineyard, tea, forest, cardamom, combined or spicy urchins, by its match and juicy strawberry, cherry, and soft tannins. Uh, 91 from suckling, soft, fruity, red, plum, berry aromas, flavors, citrus, and cedar, easy to drink, certainly, with real Russian River Pinot character, ripe strawberries, which I actually do see now, warm, earthy undertones, sustainable drink or hold, 90 from the spectator, too, fresh cracked white pepper and the dried red fruit, berry flavors uh, framed with crunchy acidity and tannins, juicy finish offers vibrant forest floor and hints of hazelnut. Just, just gorgeous. Just gorgeous. Mm. Such a nice wine. Such a nice wine. Um, I thought the plant I would talk about is Christmas cactus. Uh, Slumbergera is, in fact, a Latin name for them. Also, really interesting group of plants. Uh, they're from Brazil. Uh, in fact, actually not very far from Rio for the most part. Uh, they're epiphytes. They live in trees. Uh, in fact, this is the thing. So they don't need a whole lot of soil, which is why you can have them for a very long time. And so they do. And there are a number of different species that are made into this, and I won't get geeky on you about it, but in fact, there are two mainer ones. And so part of it makes the Thanksgiving cactus, which in fact they've already, for most of you, if you have one, have bloomed. And then the Christmas cactus, which tend to have rounder flowers, and it doesn't have sort of like the sharp indentations, almost like the crab claws, uh, are in fact the two major ones. And of course, they've been bred together so many different times. Uh, and so easy to grow. And so you see here the golden fantasy. Uh, again, they were able to use different species because they used to not ever. They were always either red or pink, uh, et cetera. And now you're seeing a lot more different colors that are, are in there. Uh, this, see how it's round at the end? That's one of the, uh, that would be more one of the Christmas, here's Christmas fantasy. Beautiful, beautiful colors. Um, relatively easy to grow. I know so many people have had them that have been their mothers or grandmothers. Um, the only thing that's important is to get them to bloom they need to have short days. And so if they're getting sun until or light, in other words, you're, you're keep them in a room where it gets light till 10, 11 o'clock, they won't bloom. And so putting them away into a room that isn't, or that just gets natural day length, then of course they will. I leave mine out until practically frost. Uh, and in fact, I have two that have just finished blooming uh, for me uh, in there. Okay, any questions, Emily? Um, yeah, one person asked, is pouring Red wine through an aerator affect the taste of the wine. Yes, it does. Um, is that a good thing? Uh, that's the other question. I will. Uh, I won't say a whole lot of this about it, but it, there is an excellent. Uh, in fact, obviously, if you're interested, there is an excellent wine blog called Vinography. V-I-N-O-G-R-A-P-H-Y. It's done by a man by the name of Alder, A-L-D-E-R, Yarrow, R-A-R-R-Y-A-R-R-O-W. And we agree. I, I think that an aerator, I don't use them. 
uh, you know, if I have a young wine that needs some time, I will put them in a decanter. Um, and he, I, you know, I could, I didn't put it in, but he, in fact, uh, uses, in fact, numerous expletives about the millions of dollars that are are spent, and he feels wasted on aerators. I, I really think it's more of a, it's a, it's a more of a trick thing than anything else. And so, and it's not necessary. Um, by the way, I, I hate to step on people's toes, but I've talked to so many people about this too. I feel the same way about wine refrigerators. The problem with wine refrigerators is they can go bad. I've talked to too many people who suddenly find that their wine refrigerator has gone on the fritz and all the wine is at 120 degrees and is cooked. As long as you have a relatively a dark place that doesn't change temperature very well and is relatively cool, unless you plan on keeping wine for 10, 15, 20 years, and I, you know, don't worry about it. You know, the wine will be fine. I, I may have told, said this before, I think that I will tell you for years, uh, until of course I moved into this house, I had a stack of wine in my bedroom. It was over the side. And of course, luckily I liked it cool, you know, in the in the summertime. And so I would have the air AC on. But it was like the wine was fine. It really was okay when I moved here. And so, and so you don't need all of the contraptions. You know, wine should be easy and natural. So keep it that way. I think both aerators and refrigerators, it just isn't quite necessary. Yeah, you know, and you'll save on your electric bill. So why not? Anything else? We have other questions, but that's the most, that's the one that's related sure. to this. Okay, great. Let's go to the next wine. The next wine is, of course, the Ben Marco uh, Malbec. Um, and I have already opened this. And so you can see that I have the bottle here. I really like that they have the uh, pruners or in French, a secateurs, uh, which is a great word uh, for it with the grapes. In fact, actually, come to think of one of the pictures you'll see, in fact, is very close to that. First of all, look at the color. This is, of course, it's, I just put this in a red wine glass just because it was there. Look at the color. I'm not just super dark, but certainly a lot darker than that Pinot Noir uh, that is there. And so has really nice and very red, uh, which is not surprising. That's very typical of Malbec uh, with this. And, of course, if you swirl, and smell this wine. Hmm, darker. Uh, lots of fruit, lots of fruit. Plums. Uh, oh, yeah, plums. Oh, and now it comes up with sort of a spiciness that's there also. Oh, yeah. And just, in fact, a real bright, almost crazy, almost a red licorice. Yeah, real bright, real fruity, real good acidity. That comes off of there. Mm, very nice. And of course, if you taste this one, mm, very, very nice. Um, bright has has a real grip of of tannins that are still there but of course it's got all that fruit that that's nicely in balance um and you really get that in fact the, sort of the tannins then ease up and then you still have all of that fruit on your palate it really is a uh, just really really nice and easy and pretty easy to drink but it would also make a very nice food wine i can see many things um has in fact to tell you the truth that i didn't put it up there I can sort of feel the um, the alcohol, so I would not be surprised if this at least has 14.5. Uh, I would not be surprised by that at all in there. Uh, for one thing, this is from the Uka River Valley, or, and the Uka Valley, which is very, it's sort of a valley, but again, very high, because again, you're getting into the Andes uh, in all of this. But again, the nice dark richness to that wine, but yet at the same time, that really nice sort of really bright fruit, almost a little... Jolly Rancher like uh, in that real bright fruit that's there. Yeah, mm, nice. And there's a little greenness too in that finish. You always find new things in wines. That's a great. So, some things about this wine. Here we are in Argentina, there in the Southern Hemisphere. 
Uh, here is where the Uco River, the Uco Valley is, not very far from Mendoza, uh, up there in the Andes, as you can see, because Chile is right there. So the Andes are in between uh, there. Many of these wineries, in fact, there and in Salta are three, four, five thousand feet above sea level. Uh, in fact, they have to worry about hail very often. Um, the grapes get very thick skin because they have all that UV light at those elevations. Many of these, um, uh, many, most of the atmosphere is well below where you are when you have this. By the way, though, the Uco River Valley or the Uco Valley, and I've talked to a number of people who have gone there. I mean, they really are set up for wine tourism. So a wonderful place between uh, uh, Zatena. Uh, are, 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 are just really wonderful places that are there. Katena is what I meant to say. And look at this. I mean, who wouldn't want to go and see that place? I mean, it's just so beautiful with the Andes in the background and the whole bit. Just absolutely wonderful. Um, this is one of Susan Balbo's wine. Uh, she overlooks, in fact, a number of them, but the, the gentleman who is the winemaker uh, for this, in fact, is very, very well known and respected uh, in Argentine societies. Um, they farm a lot, about 3,000 acres uh, in all uh, in the wines that they make uh, here at Ben Marco uh, there. Look at the pictures. Ah, it's just so beautiful. Um, interestingly enough, I just saw yesterday. Um, it's interesting because I would think, you know, Argentina has been very strong. Uh, they've actually had a reduction in about 20% reduction in exports uh, in the past year. So that was a, a bit surprising, actually. But this is, in fact, something that I, that I just read. I didn't look much more into it as much as I should have. Uh, the grapes are hand-selected. And so that's what they show you, the 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 pruners, the secretaries for cutting the grapes, destemming and soft crushing. Um, they do, and actually, it's, of course, it's funny, they say push downs, punch downs is what we typically call them. In other words, they take a big thing and they, they punch the, because remember, all the color in a grape is in the skins. And so he has to be in contact with the juice and the fermenting wine to pull out that color. And so in many cases, you have the cap at the top where it all is. So you have to punch it down from time to time to get, in fact, that wine then or that color out of there. So as they're talking about punch downs on a daily basis, so every day, um, extended maceration. So in other words, even though fermentation may only take 11 or 12 days, they allow the skins to sit in the finished wine because it softens up the wine, makes it a little rounder, makes it a little better. Fairly warm fermentation. 82 is about normal. Um, usually you don't ever want to go above 90. Uh, and then they age it for 11 months in 100% in second-use French oak. So no new oak, uh, but it's still, you get that, the softening from the, what we call micro-oxygenation, uh, and, you know, sort of very nice, and a little bit of oak flavor, in fact, from that wine. So very, very nice uh, that is there. And did they like it? Of course, it's a great picture, uh, as you can see, with the secateurs and, of course, uh, the grapes that are there, the Malbec uh, grapes. Very, very bluish. And by the way, why they're sort of white? Because it's covered with yeast. Uh, yeast grow naturally, in fact, on the grapes themselves. And that's what you're seeing in that picture. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, did they like it? James Cycling gave it 93. Fine tannin, which it is, polished red, medium body, refined texture, lovely length. Goes on and on. Hints of asphalt and graphite. Tar and graphite, I don't know if I get a whole lot of that. It's sort of dark, but I'm not sure I would go that far. But again, that's certainly what he thinks. Um, at the end, Parker, again, typically Robert Parker tends to be a bit more conservative. 92 points. Um, and I, I agree more of this. Floral, spicy, aromatic, showy, and expressive. Lots of aromatic herbs, black peppers, and flowers. Both good ripeness and freshness with very fine tans. It's ripe without excess and elegant. Beautiful Malbec. Mm, yes, very, very nice. The last plant I want to talk about, in fact, as you can see, up at the top is, in fact, it's, it's basically Aztec name, uh, uh, then, of course, it's Latin name, Euphorbia pulcorima. Pulcorima means beautiful. And, of course, this is poinsettias. Um, poinsettias are, of course, like the Christmas flower. Uh, this is what the original plant looked like, though. <clears throat> it grew, of course, it grows in the lowlands of, um, of Mexico. Uh, but the Aztecs, in fact, love it, even though it's too in Mexico City, where there was their capital at that point, uh, was too far north. In fact, they would, in fact, cut and bring in 
just you know complete wagons of these in fact for their uh, various rituals and for decorations uh, in there. Why do we call it Poinsettia? Because of this man. This is Joel Robert Poinsett. Uh, he was the first ambassador to Mexico. He was also a botanist. And he probably, in fact, I went down a rabbit hole in doing this. He probably, in fact, sent some plants, in fact, to the Philadelphia Flower Show, or people in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, uh, and they showed it off. And then the first plantsman grew it there, and he called it by its Latin name, but then someone else basically said, oh, no, we need to call it Poinsettia. And so that's why we still, in fact, have enshrined his name uh, in there. Like all people, he did many nice things, but he also did some things that um, that are not considered to be really good, like, in fact, sort of sending the Indians away and never things like that. But an interesting life Joel Poinsett had in there. Um, Poinsettias are interesting simply because if you talk to your, gee, I'm not even sure who you talk to now, but if you look at historically, I mean, the plants didn't live. In other words, very often they would plant them with ferns because by Christmas time, you might have a few red leaves. By the way, that's not, those are not petals. Those, in fact, are red leaves around the flower. Um, would have a few red leaves left. Luckily, of course, what happened was both you know, breeding. In fact, this one, uh, Annette Haig, was one of the first ones to come out of Germany, in fact, in the 60s, and actually held, and in fact, could be branched, because typically, you would just have a flower on the very top uh, of them. The other thing, and of course, I remember this very well, when I came to Miami, I grew a poinsettia crop. And what I would have to do was, when, after I planned them and wanted to start them, every night before leaving work, uh, around five o'clock, I would have to cover them completely with a black cloth because they needed also long, actually they needed long nights. It isn't so much the short days, but they need a long night and that forces them to bloom. If they get light at night, they will not bloom. So you had to cover them over for them to bloom. Luckily, thanks to breeding, you don't have to do this. Now they just simply do it naturally through natural day length. And so you don't have to cover them over anymore. But that's in fact how it was. In fact, if you look carefully, you can still see the strings on both sides. This is one of my poinsettia crops in the greenhouse. But in fact, you can see the strings that were left where I used to pull the black cloth, in fact, over them uh, so that they would, in fact, bloom. Um, the other thing is, and I never heard of this, here they make these nice branch plants because of a disease. It's a phytoplasma. It's, in fact, a, you know, a kind of almost a virus-like thing that it causes the plant to, in fact, break and make side branches, in other words, so that this makes the plants this. In fact, if you make a new cultivar, a new variety of poinsettia, you have to infect it to get it, in fact, to branch. Otherwise, you would have have single plants. So it's really interesting. And of course, they used to grow them in mother plants, and then the greenhouses would take cuttings. Today, everything comes out of South, of South America. You get the cuttings, you plant them, you grow the crop, and that's it. By the way, care, um, semi-cool humid conditions and bright and direct light, you know, during this Christmas season, plenty of moisture, let almost go almost dry between waterings and to keep out of warm drafts. And the plants will last beautifully. And many people keep them just as green plants. And you can, in fact, as long as you get in the right day length, um, that they will bloom again. Some cultivars. Uh, this is Ice Punch, uh, which is sort of one of the newer ones that's there. Uh, this is Autumn Leaves. Uh, go ahead, look at the colors. I mean, you know, it's like you can see a lot of those there. Uh, it's interesting that I was talking to a person who works in the greenhouses, and they were saying that with younger customers who weren't uh, uh, accustomed to this, the white poinsettias, quote unquote, white poinsettias that we would have would always be cream colored because they didn't. And they spent probably about 15 years worth of plant breeding to finally get this polar bear, which in fact is a white poinsettia and to get them really white in there. And there are other things I won't go into just because of time. Uh, this has always been one of my favorites. This is called uh, Visions of Grandeur. By the way, <clears throat> look at the picture. You see the yellow things in the middle? Those are the flowers. Everything else you see there are colored leaves. And in fact, when you buy a poinsettia, you want to make sure it has those yellow things in the middle. In fact, that they're just starting to open and grow. That means you've got a fresh one. If they're gone, that plant's been there a while. So again, just a good word to the wise when it comes to that. <coughs> Excuse me. Questions, Emily? Um, yes. Someone said that they weren't able to find that exact Ben Marco, um, but they found another one that's a Malbec and a Cab Franc blend. Do you have any ideas on how those might be different? 
Uh, probably just off the top of my head, and certainly I would not trying it. In fact, I may talk to the rep about this. Um, probably a little darker, a little richer, because what you're getting out of the cab is more tannin. Uh, and so it's going to be it's going to be darker and richer and a little heavier uh, than this, even though this wine is lovely and could go, I think, with any number of different dishes, you know, of course, beef or lamb, etc. That one will be a little bigger, a little richer, a little uh, a little more sort of grip to it, a little more depth to the wine would be my guess on that. Okay. Yep, that's only one related to this. We have other well, questions, but I can't sure, them for that. Well, we'll continue on then. Oops. Is it there? No, for some reason. There they are. I knew Harvey and Harriet were somewhere around there. Uh, this is also, in fact, a glass uh, that was given me by a former student that was up for a tasting. Nice dark color to that wine. This, of course, as you can see, is Harvey and Harriet, an interesting name for a wine. Um, darker yet, but not super dark. You know, I mean, I can sort of, eh, maybe I can't see through it. I'm looking at the, my reflection actually from my dye, I think. Uh, and so much darker, uh, but still very reddish. Of course, it's still relatively young uh, in that wine. And so it has really nice uh, dark color there. Beautiful glass. Also, in fact, does help a little bit. Yes, much darker. In fact, darker than the Ben Marco also. But if you swirl and smell this wine, it's it's really interesting because it's it really is bright. It's light. It's fresh. You know, you would think that this a wine like this would be a bit heavier, darker, where this does. I mean, it really is very inviting notes. It really, it draws you in because it's really fresh, bright fruit, uh, very red fruits, not black fruits. I mean, really things like cherries or currants or, you know, even bright plums or whatever in that nose. Little, although a little bit of chocolate, a little bit of uh, sort of chocolate, a little bit of tobacco in the in the finish. Very, very, very pretty. And of course, if you taste this wine. Obviously, lots of tannin, lots of grip, uh, but lots of fruit. So this wine is completely drinkable now. And this wine would probably last 10 years. I mean, you can just sort of tell. It's a little bit that the tannins have a little bit of a graininess to them. You can feel it sort of on your tongue. It's probably, in fact, complexing the proteins, et cetera, that's on your tongue uh, there. And actually, let me see the bottle for a second. Thank you. I should look more carefully. Um, alcohol's 14.3. I did think it was, you know, and trust me, I can't tell the difference between two percent, two tenths of a percent alcohol, but it seems less alcoholic than the Ben Marco, probably because it has more going on in it too. And so it's better balanced. I feel a little heat, but still really nice. But it really has a wonderful bright fruit to it. Yeah. And a, an, an herbalness, not quite rosemary or mint, but sort of getting towards that. It's really fresh. Pine, maybe it's a tree behind me. Mm. Very, very nice. Nice wine. And, and you could certainly have this, you know, very often people serve like prime rib or or you know something else at Christmas time, and this wine would go beautifully with that. But at the same time, isn't so. I could see even having this. I mean, I think even some of the casseroles, you know, so with roasted vegetables or, um, oh yeah, I made recently a risotto with uh, with bacon and um, uh, uh, squash, a uh, not acorn squash, uh, butternut squash. And, and I could see because of the bacony and of course squash also has a bit of a grip to it, would go very well with this. Yeah, sort of interesting. So let me tell you something about this wine. 
do to do put that over there uh as you can see uh strange name harvey and harriet uh it is from paso robo so i wonder why that picture didn't come up i actually had a picture of where paso is in huh i wonder why that didn't come it was there on when i did it oh well um paso robos of course is south of san francisco uh has a number of things you can see of course from the town of paso but this of course is sort of um Yes, between L.A. and San Francisco, a bit to the south. Uh, there, not very far from the ocean, as you can see, broken up into a number of other areas uh, that are there. Uh, this, in fact, is the winery owner. This is Eric Jensen uh, in there. Uh, this, of course, I mean, beautiful winery. I mean, it just, I look at this and think, oh, I'd like to visit there. That's really something. This is actually his Booker Vineyard. Uh, very interesting gentleman. This is fact, pictures, in fact, from there of, of, uh, harvest uh, and then bring in the grapes, uh, etc. The wine is called Harvey and Harriet, but the overarching name, if you look in the back label, is my favorite neighbor. And that's because Eric Jensen, who owned Booker Vineyards, which by the way has now been sold to a very large conglomerate called Constellation. They bought, in fact, all of this, but he, in fact, has remained the head. He was called my favorite neighbor by Stefan Aseo. Stefan Aseo is the winemaker, or actually the owner of La Venture. La Venture is a winery down in that area that is, you know, internationally known. He makes very, 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 very good and very expensive wines. And he's, in fact, French. So in his very wonderful, thick French accent, he would always call up Eric, and call him, in fact, my favorite neighbor. Uh, and so that, in fact, is where the name for this comes. It is also because Eric owned Booker Vineyards, but he, of course, down, especially Paso Robles, is, you know, it's relatively new when it comes to doing this. And so, you know, people make wine, you know, they're passionate about it. And so their friends are friends who make wine. And so a lot of this stuff is almost a cooperative kind of thing where he will source grapes from a number of his neighbors. And so that's why this whole favorite neighbor, in fact, comes from. Harvey and Harriet were his parents. <clears throat> he said, wonderful people, didn't have any, you know, no one didn't like them, etc. And so they were also a favorite neighbor, he thought. And so this is why he has actually named this as an homage to his parents, and there they are. There's Harvey and Harriet. So you can actually see why this wine has been named. They make a Cabernet and also red blend, the Cabernet more expensive, and also very good, but this is in fact it. Uh, it's quite the blend. Look at that. 40% Cabernet Sauvignon, 20% Syrah, 10% Petit Syrah. Gives it the nice dark color. 10% Cabernet Franc, a little spiciness. Petit Verdot, again, a wine a grape that we're going to see more and more of in the future. 10% Malbec, we just had. It spent 80%, 18 months in 60%. And it's interesting, they say new oak equivalent, which is probably stays, meaning what they do is they have older barrels and they will put new oak staves, in other words, piece of wood, into the into the older barrels because then they'll get the new oak flavor in fact from those from those pieces of wood that they will put down into the barrel and so that's where that's come from and so that's how in fact they've done that in there did they like it look at that 94 from jeb dunnick as the reds the 19 harvey and harris thought it more approachable lush red which it certainly is black fruit driven straight cabernet blackberries Sweet tobacco, cedar, some floral, violet nuances in the nose, medium full body, beautiful texture, silky tannins, smoking value and was plenty of upfront charm, certainly has a decade or more of overall longevity. Uh, 94 from Parker. Um, again, beguiling red and black cherries, tar, coffee, beans, dark, fruity, savory accents, nose, full bodied, light, light on the feet. That, that's really what comes across it. It is very light, easy to drink, offers a fine balance of powerful fruit, intensity, and seamless freshness. A style that will appeal to a wide range of red wine drinkers, from lovers of Zin to fans of Cabernet. Certainly no question about that at all. So uh, a beautiful, beautiful group of wines. Many of them, I think, would work very well for whatever occasion you happen to be having at Christmas time. Questions? Yeah. Um, someone said... And I apologize for my stuffy nose and my scratchy voice. Um, if we want to do a wine tasting at home, for example, high tannin red versus low tannin red, how would we know which wines to buy? Also, would um, 
what would be another tasting note comparison um, that you would suggest in an at-home tasting? Um, well, for one thing, uh, for me, when it comes to, especially when you're first starting to do tastings, um, do a varietal tasting. In other words, have six different grapes, get to know the grapes. Then, and then as you do that, go do individual countries. Or if you want to use a certain grape, uh, say Cabernet or Malbec or Pinot Noir or Syrah is another good one. Find ones from a warm climate, find ones from a cooler climate because you'll see real stylistic differences. You know, there's no question that grapes are the canary in the coal mine when it comes to being able or or changing due to climate, in fact, from year to year. And that's why vintage ends up being so important because we have all of these, all of these differences that happen there. It is true. Sometimes it's hard to figure out exactly what to pick to get up the, you know, the good examples. And of course, the other problem is the wonderful wine laws here. And what I could maybe tell you is available here in Ohio isn't available in a different state. You know, and I'll be honest, I, you know, I uh, for example, all of these wines, when I look online on, you know, wine.com, because that's what I do to make sure that you can get to as wide an audience as possible, they were available. But the problem is, is if this wine, say, for example, this one, if this wine is available in a different state in the market, in other words, if it's in, well, then wine.com in many cases is prohibited from selling that wine in that market in that state. And so then you have to go to your local wine place and hopefully their distributor gets that wine so that you can get it. So these are some of the problems, in fact, that I find dealing like for me to tell you sort of what would be. But those are my first things. I think a varietal tasting is always good. And then you can look at the stylistic differences of the different grapes because Lord knows they have them. Pinot Noir, Cabernet, Malbec, any of them. And certainly whites too. Chardonnay, oak or not oak. And the problem ends up being is that's where very often a good wine shop can give you a heads up because these people should be experts and they should be able to then point you in the right direction for the wine things to make, in fact, a very interesting tasting. So that's probably very often knowing a good, um, you know, a good expert or a good um, uh, uh, person in a wine shop is probably invaluable uh, to do those things. So that's what I would do. By the way, I, I meant to show you this before. You see my Amaryllis. And of course, I laugh because I bought it. It was supposed to be red. I haven't taken it back or I haven't taken a picture to a friend of mine where I bought it to say, uh, do you like my white uh, amaryllis? It's really pretty. Uh, but in fact, it just bloomed, started blooming today so that I would share that with you. Okay. Anything else, Emily? Yeah. Um, can you talk about, actually, actually, can you remind me, do you have one more wine left or was that no, your we're last? Done. <laughs> Okay. Then I'll ask these questions. I was like, oh, <laughs> one left. Um, Okay, can you talk about grower wines versus factory wines? Sure. Uh, and, and I'm not sure. In fact, there's all things. I don't... Let me see how I can... How can I phrase this properly? And, and really because I don't have a problem with either. I, I drink, for the most part, grower wines factory wines and and you and I and I don't want that in fact to be derogatory but let's face it many of the wines that are on the market and certainly in that probably 10 to 15 dollar range are wines that are made by large companies uh that in fact do focus groups uh and look at things that in fact make the wines um enjoyable um but a bit anodyne a bit they don't have a lot of you know sort of individuality to them which is fine you know i mean because a lot of times it's like this is what you like this is what you want to drink that's fine and and that it's fine and in many cases maybe a good way to to sort of start in the wine business oh i like this etc i find that they tend to be you know nice and easy and not very interesting and so for me uh, it's the people who have something to say with their wines uh, that the wines that I like. And so this is why I usually do use like smaller um, production or people is, by the way, in fact, and I would like, I would love to visit the, um, 
uh, the my favorite neighbor wines, etc. I mean, for one thing, they seem really wonderfully hipster. I mean, you really get that vibe if you look at them. In fact, you look at their Insta pictures, and of course, they're on Facebook. I mean, you get this whole vibe about the whole thing. And so, again, it would be really fun, in fact, to do this. And certainly, they're not stuffy by any means, but it really ends up being fun. And that's one of the things that's interesting about wine. But for me, you know, it's the people. And I'm not and I'm not saying that people, you know, the big boys don't have the passion for doing what they're doing, but it's the small producers who make those more idiosyncratic wines, the wines that that really speak for them that I find more interesting as a general rule, you know, and and it really makes it fun because it's not just drinking the wine, though that's fun. It's knowing their stories, it's getting the background, and etc. And it's Trying new grape varieties. Uh, to me, that's what makes wine really interesting. Anything else? Yeah, we'll ask a couple more. Sure. Um, have you, do you have any experiences with wine of the month clubs or programs? And what are some of the pros and cons of getting into these, do you think? I, I've never done it. I have too much wine anyway. In fact, you know, anybody come to my house. Come on, any day, you know, just give me a call. We'll open a bottle or two. Uh, I, I, I wish I wish I were kidding. There's too much wine in this house. Uh, but that's the other point. Anyway, uh, so the problem ends up being with, uh, and and you can look, I really do think, and I, right off the top of my head, you know, I think it's a connoisseur's guide. You can look, I think, Wire cutter. For one thing, I like wire cutter, which is through the New York Times, and they give like best of this and that. And you can look at them and make your own decisions. There are, in fact, some of them that actually do a good job. I, you know, for me, I don't want to be stuck uh, in there. But of course, I've been tasting and drinking wine for a very long time. And so it could, I think, that I really think that if you find a good one, uh, and I think of the, I think it's Connoisseur's Guide out of California that's been around for a very long time um, that do a good job. Um, I will tell you, I don't get their wine of the month, but one of the flash sites that has really interesting wines is Wine Access uh, that I that I find sort of interesting. Um, and I also there's a group called Big Hammer uh, that also has interesting wines uh, for purchase. Uh, yeah, because you know, I'm to the point now where I'm like, oh, I just bought a wine. I'd never heard of this grape before. And so I, I bought it. In fact, it was interesting. I opened it for friends just a couple of nights ago. And they're like, oh, this is really interesting. I said, yeah, I've never had this wine. It's an Italian white uh, that that I bought some because I thought I've never had this wine before. In fact, actually, I'm waiting for a few days. I'm actually have, getting a, a wine from Spain out of Rioja that's made from a grape that I've known forever called Graziano, but it's the only one I've ever heard that's 100% Graziano. And so it makes it fun to try those kinds of wines. But, you know, I've been drinking wine for a long time. So getting back to the, to the point, I think the book, the Wine of the Month Club, if you can get a good one, is good. Otherwise, too often I find, I look at the names and think, well, I don't recognize any of these names. And so some of them make wines or they buy wines that are made specifically for the wine of the month club. And in many cases, it's bulk wine and it's stuff that they have and they put their own names on it. I don't like that. You know, I want to know who, what I'm drinking and who it's from. And so and there are wineries that do that. And I, I apologize. I can't tell you right off the top of my head, but you can look online and I would try for some reason I think Wirecutter did it and somebody else did as to what are the best wine of the month clubs especially for what you're looking for um because yeah I'm I hate to say it but I think there are a number of sort of they're a little sketchy you know they're a little fly by night and don't really give you the value that you could get by going to a good wine shop and having them pick you out a wine ever for for the month or whatever my own opinion more than anything else anything else yeah um so we did we got a lot of questions in and i'm sorry i don't think we're going to be able to get to all of them we are getting close to the hour and a half so i'm going to ask one more um with one bonus question someone said your tree is beautiful and they want to know how tall it is and <laughs> if it's real or fake i read the green of the 42 years of course it's real 
In <laughs> fact, you know, again, if you're in Oxford, you know, come see my tree. I have people come see my tree all the time. In fact, I have a come see my tree. Um, it's real. It's a Fraser fir. Um, it's a little shorter this year. It's only about 10 foot. Uh, very often it's usually been a lot more. Uh, in fact, I was, in fact, I was, I was laughing because if you, and I'm going to do this, I think I can see, you can see this part of my tree and then you can see up into the balcony and then you can see all of my plantings of my flower things over there. Um, I do way too much. Um, I do way too much decorating. And of course, I, as fact, I was telling the guys who are here, I don't do it for myself. I do it also to share with everybody else. So come see my tree. I've got plenty of wine. Uh, you know, just <laughs> give me a call. I'm only gone for a few days at Christmas. It's not a problem. It'll be up for a fair length of time longer. But yes, and so I collect, as you can see, I, you know, lots of glass ornaments and my tree is all silver and gold. It is fun to do and it's fun to have people come and see it. All right, and one last wine question, and then we will conclude tonight's tasting. Um, do you feel that there is any value in organic wine other than the ecological value? <laughs> I may be the wrong person to ask. Um, it was interesting. Uh, there was, in fact, a, a quiz in today's New York Times. Um, I, I taught horticulture for a very long time. And I am still not, and I probably shouldn't even say this, I, I'm still not completely sold on the whole organic thing. I feel that farmers, A, certainly do not want to harm themselves and certainly do not want to harm the people that they have. So I think that farmers in general are very, very conscious of the environment and what they're putting into the environment. And so I don't buy organic. I simply don't. I really do think that you often are paying for something that doesn't exist. And so, but, you know, I taught horticulture and so on, and it's a bias. And I know it's a bias, but I think to a great extent, you can find a lot of data that supports that uh, in there. And so, and it's interesting because you hear a tremendous amount of buzz about this. And I'm not sure that the general public is that interested or if it's only a small portion of it. But I think, too, wineries the same way. These people are probably the most, all of them, as a general rule, obviously you're going to get a bad apple from time to time, are probably some of the most ecologically minded people in the world because it's their livelihood. If they screw it up, they're doomed. And so I... I think that wine is natural, regardless of what label you put on it, for the most part it is. And actually, and I don't have a problem. You will probably be seeing ingredient labels. In fact, Ridge Vineyards has always done this. You'll start seeing ingredient labels on wine. And I have no problem with it because for the most part, practically nothing should be in wine other than grapes and the yeast and a couple other things. And so it should be fine. You should have no problem being able to tell anyone and any good winemaker will tell you exactly what's in that wine. And so I think that's a that's a good thing for us. But I'm, uh, you know, yeah, I don't, I don't notice if a wine is organic or not, because uh, I think most of them try to be as sustainable as possible. Uh, but again, I have my own biases, and I'm, I'm more than happy to admit that, uh, sort of in there. Okay. Yep. Okay. Right. Well, that's our last question. Any... I've got a couple things to finish up with then. As right. you do, there is my addendum for that. Uh, for one thing, I always show pictures of, of and this is taken today uh, on campus. Uh, this is the new information systems building that is going up uh, there where Swing Hall was. And there are some aspects about this building that will just be amazing. So when it's done and you can come, you can come see the green screens and things that they're doing in that building. It will be absolutely amazing to see. Um, I had a show, of course, Beta House was in uh, Christmas decorations. You might notice the, the poor Santa uh, 
thing at the top was all deflated. Of course, it's empty. Had to show a picture of Slant Walk, uh, again, s without any students, uh, because, of course, the university has gone into its wintertime slumber, uh, as it does. These are all taken today. This is the new building that will be the nursing and also uh, the speech and hearing center. And there are other things from everything I hear. It is just an amazing building. So, uh, again, something else. I've had friends who have taken tours of it and have in fact raved about some of the things that will be going on in that building. So that's wonderful to see the university moving in that direction. Um, this was also wonderful. I don't know if you saw recently that in fact um, it was, I, I, I should look at it more carefully, I think it's Carol and Richard Cox, uh, they gave a significant donation to the university um, to supplement the art museum, which is just absolutely wonderful. We have a great art museum, so thanks to them uh, for believing in Miami University. Um, and of course, I had to show you know, Western Campus and all the trees, etc. And probably about the best thing, oops, what's going on? Why am I not moving? Slide? Huh, I wonder what happened. I will not be happy. I think it might have only let you upload 100 slides. Well, isn't that crazy? Because <laughs> I just saw that slide 100, so that might be our problem. I know. Gee, <laughs> technology. We've never had awesome. someone with 100 slides before, so oh, here are our first. <laughs> oh, I think I have. Anyway, then I'm going to tell you two things. First and foremost, uh, and I really have to say this because I really am very pleased. The announcement came today that Dr. Uh, Elizabeth Molinex is our new provost, and she will be a shining light. She is a shining light here at Miami University, and I am thrilled that she, in fact, will be the provost. Uh, she will now be permanent. She was interim. Uh, in there, and I'm trying to think if there was something else. Yes, I had some things about Christmas trees, but I guess that does it. Have a wonderful, oh yeah, I can't even, my, my final slide isn't even there. About to tell you to have a wonderful holiday and thank you so much for your support of Miami University and I hope you have a wonderful 2023. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jack. And thank you to everyone that joined us tonight. Again, thank you for all your questions. I am sorry if we weren't able to get to them. Um, um, join us. We already have, so this will be our last webinar. Um, actually, yeah, it's one of our last webinars for 2022. Um, we have one more next week and then we have, we already have webinars planned for January, 2023. Um, Jack might be back in March so, or February. So February, stay tuned yeah. for that. The February champagne tasting. Well, we do use yeah. three months. Yeah. February 13th. I was just going to tease it. So, um, <laughs> Be prepared for that. <laughs> you can find all of these and register online at um, alumlc.org backslash Miami OH. Again, they are free and open to everyone. Um, so have a great rest of your evening. Have a great holiday season. And thank you again to you, Jack. Take care.